All right, can you guys see the presentation? Yes. Yep. Okay. Charlie, you're muted, by the way. Thanks. Um, so are we ready? Or? Yep. Okay, I'm Charlie Mione. I'm Benjamin Sims. And I'm Eller Bermudez. And today we're going to be talking to you about security and cloud computing, specifically DDoS, MITM, and SQL injection attacks. So cloud computing is important because it lets users and companies access computing power without the need to buy and keep their parts forever. So for example, say a company like Amazon realizes that it needs a lot more power to handle its users on the first day of a sale than it normally does. Uh, they could improve their entire network to handle these rare events, but that would be costly and kind of a waste. So it'd be more efficient to just temporarily pay for more power for that short period. Unfortunately, cloud computing is vulnerable to a lot of the same techniques which have been played in the internet for a long time, including having most entities access data from the server and collect it, change the data they have access to, to something incorrect, delete it entirely, or perform a DDoS attack to take down the server. We chose these specific attacks because they're highly prevalent and impactful in our everyday lives. For example, an SQL injection attack happened in 7-Eleven and over 130 million credit card um, cards numbers were taken. And uh, an example of an MITM attack is Comcast. They use a man in the middle attack to advertise their company. This happens when users connect to an insecure website over HTTP and when the website when you go to the website, a request is sent to Comcast. And when they respond, the source code is sent. What they're doing is injecting their own code in it and sending it to us, which provides us with the website and their ad. And then an example of a DDoS attack is GitHub in 2018. The DDoS attack clocked in at 1.35 terabits per second, which you can see on this graph, which overwhelmed their servers. They were prepared for an attack, but not at this capacity. So current related works with regards to DDoSing in the cloud environment um, is that DDoS attacks are very common and they come in many different varieties. Um, in one paper, uh, they just announced this many attacks, uh, including amplification attacks, bandwidth attacks, DNS flooding, ping flooding, ping of death, HTTP post flooding, reflector attacks, Murph attacks, and more. Um, current papers addressing the issue of DDoS attacks in the cloud context can employ either mathematical or framework architectural models. Um, one paper used a discrete Fourier transform called the Fast Hartley transform to analyze and see if a DDoS attack is happening. Um, while other papers employ architectural frameworks like CAPTCHAs and queuing models. Um, newer technologies are also being employed such as machine learning and software defined networking. Um, and those can allow more opportunities to detect and prevent DDoS attacks. The Open Web Application Security Project lists injection as the number one threat to web application security. Attackers use SQL injection to retrieve our credentials and they can even use those credentials to impersonate administrators. It allows them not only to alter the data in the database, but they can add or delete whatever they want. Uh, there are a few architecture designs that people are working on, including top-down network design and multi-layer security in order to prevent these threats and protect data. Artworks found that uh, MITM is vulnerable to abuse by security certificates. So a recent paper titled Man in the Middle Attacks to the HTTPS Protocol found a way to retrieve information sent to HTTPS websites by falsifying certificates. People often blindly trust these websites because of the S in HTTPS meaning secured, and they often ignore these kinds of errors from their web browser because the website will look normal to them. A different paper titled A Survey of Man in the Middle Attacks explains how an attacker could insert themselves between a victim and the web server they're trying to access, then form a secure connection to each of them while relaying their messages to each other. This makes it look like the connection's fine for both the victim and web server since it'll be acting normally for them. Lastly, the border gateway protocol attack abuses the routing protocol of info on the internet to route traffic to an attacker's network that shouldn't be going there. So some problems with current solutions with DDoS attacks is that DDoS attacks are relatively common and powerful. Um, cloud services often have multiple services sharing resources, uh, like many different companies on the same servers. So if one company was attacked, then other companies may fall in collateral too. 
uh, DDoS attacks are prevalent because attackers can spread malware to normal machines and turning them into a zombie computer to perform these attacks. And there will be often many computers in one network called a botnet to do that. Uh, newer state-of-the-art technologies like software-defined networks and machine learning algorithms can be applied more efficiently as the technologies become more studied. Um, machine learning is becoming very popular nowadays, but software-defined networks are only about 10 years old. Um, also, some prevention methods might be more intrusive. Like, I'm sure we've all had to do a CAPTCHA test to get access to a website or to get some service. Um, those can be kind of a nuisance on users, and CAPTCHAs aren't even 100% foolproof. Um, Implying more passive methods might be more beneficial to a user experience, but they might have their drawbacks too. Some problems with SQL injection is security costs in general are not as cost effective for smaller companies, so they tend to not go to cloud. The security technology that's provided by cloud service are not always equipped to analyze or detect a threat before it happens. So for this project, I'm hoping to gain more of an understanding of not only SQL injection, but the methods of preventing. Professionals are working on multi-layer security, like I said before. I also would like to be able to recognize vulnerabilities. Tesla's security research team was actually able to detect vulnerab vulnerabilities in their website before an attack could take place. Uh, the way that HTTPS actually verifies a connection is safe is by using SSL and TLS, which are designed around the idea that their security certificates could not be forged. But we now know that it is possible to do that. And a study from a few years ago showed that 0.2% of real world connections were being substituted with forged certificates. So for a little perspective on that, let's say that Facebook has about 1.7 billion users log in daily, which is what they have. This would mean that over 3 million of those connections would have been insecure. In addition, the global system for mobile telecommunications, GSM, wasn't designed at all to defend against man in the middle attacks. So a lot of phone calls are insecure. This is why we see so many things in movies about how a line isn't secure. Lastly, as mentioned before, BGP abuse works because more specific routing is usually prioritized. So if you remember a few weeks ago in class, we had an example where ISP A would receive all the information in a certain range, while ISP B received info for a user that would normally be part of ISP A's domain, but had transferred over. You can use a similar method to get information that should be going to you, and that's what attackers do in BGP attacks. So the objectives of this project uh, is to explain how the attacks happen, how can you defend against them, and the results of attacks happening, like the potential risks. Here's the schedule for the project, um, along with the focuses of each person and which attack they're studying. Um, and to conclude, we want to explore the attacks that cloud computing environments are vulnerable to and to examine methods in preventing them. Here are the references for this presentation. Are there any questions? It looks like not. Okay. <clears throat>
Are we still being on video if we're not the presenting group? Um, he said he's the professor said if everybody could stay on video during the whole everybody presenting. All right. I'm at work, so ignore the background. It's okay. Okay, can you guys see the screen? Yes. All right. Yes. Okay, so uh, my name is Mohammed Badaro, and my group members are Tommy Rodriguez and Trevor Tallian. And our project is about cloud computing, and specifically, we'll be talking about architectures and methods to improve the security of software as a service also known as SAAS, Cloud Computing Services. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So SAAS is a method of storing data in the cloud, which is hosted by third-party companies like Microsoft or Google. It eliminates the need for USB sticks or hard drives or the need to store data on any physical drives. So for example, you could basically store up to 30 terabytes of cloud storage on Google Drive. And instead of having like 30 terabyte, 31 terabyte drives, you can, store, you can store all your data on the cloud through SAS Cloud Computing Services. So thousands of companies like uh, Microsoft, Google host these storage services and companies all over the world and schools all over the world, including everyday people use Google Drive or Office 365 to store their data. For example, UCF uses O365. So Microsoft would be the third party host that stores UCF's data. Uh, SAAS doesn't only include cloud storage, but also telecommunication services such as Microsoft Teams, uh, Slack, Skype, Discord, Zoom, and it also includes email services like Gmail, Yahoo Mail, and Outlook Mail. And it also includes payroll applications that many companies use. So as you can see, these third-party hosts store a lot of data for the clients. You can go to the next slide. And what if that third-party that stores all your data was attacked. What happens to all your data? And this is where the security risk and challenges need to be addressed. So cloud computing services like SAS are prone to various security challenges such as data breach or data theft. So things like uh, cyber attacks, hacking, insider theft, or phishing. And furthermore, there can also be issues with data integrity where data is accessed by unauthorized users. And there are times when uh, cloud services may go offline. So what happens to your data then? And a lot of these companies also have a low degree of control and they don't have as much control as, as compared to the host. Uh, I'll hand it over to Tommy to talk about significance. All right, so um, for, for SAS, um, the important part is the security. Um, a lot of people do join SAS because aside from it being a uh, you know, virtual and everybody can access it. Um, they like the, the security it comes with, um, but there are some um, cons with the security. Um, so there, sometimes your account can get compromised, but they are like, uh, they have things in place to detect those type of things. Um, so they audit their, their whole network in case of that. And I don't know if you guys have ever gotten an email saying, oh, it's suspicious activity. Usually it's because of an audit that happens to the, the uh, in the whole organization. And also if, for example, you use iCloud, a lot of things are encrypted. Um, that way a user doesn't just come and they are able to uh, basically read what's you know blatantly there. Um, and so there's other things as well as identity and access management. So that basically is if you're given specific uh, duties, you can't access certain files, you can't edit certain files without um, proper permission. And then, um, and if you're ever, somebody ever comes and deletes like a whole, uh, a whole database, you do have to have some type of backups. Um, and my example would be iCloud backups. Um, sometimes somebody loses everything on the iPhone, there's iCloud backups. That's just a specific uh, um, example. There's other backups and any other SAS now. Um, and one of the biggest like harm that SAS comes with is user, it comes with from us users. 
um, we make like mistakes or uh, for example, as I said before, somebody may delete everything. Um, usually that's the user is not something the, uh, the whole program did on its own. Um, so teaching your teammates or, uh, or, or your uh, coworkers how to properly use um, the services um, will prevent all this happening. And so our objective for our project, um, it, first we're gonna be giving you the pros and cons about SAS because um, everybody should know like, oh, it, everybody would think of SAS and it's really good, but there are um, some pretty bad stuff about the security, um, like uh, permission wise, uh, that can get a little, um, that can get a little, uh, a little complicated. So um, that's, that's kind of one of the uh, hindsight of might be a con. Uh, and also we might, we're also gonna do some case studies so we're gonna give some examples of what thing happened in the past um, that may have compromised a, a security of a uh, organization. So we'll do um, that. And uh, thirdly, we're gonna be doing, um, uh, we're gonna be giving solutions to all these things. So every day, as you guys know, um, elect electronics are always progressing. So we're, there's new compromises that can happen. So we are gonna be giving rising up um, solutions to SAS for all these, um, all these new electronics. Um, so I'll pass it down to Trevor for this part. Yeah, so for the preliminary literature view, so we, uh, we could separate these things into two main topics. It's uh, preventing theft and also preventing loss. Uh, Theft obviously being someone outside of your uh, interaction with both the, the service and yourself uh, trying to steal data for whatever reason. And then loss is this either your, through your misfortune or misuse or the, um, the service's misfortune or misuse, um, losing your data. Both of these are not acceptable. Um, options for for running a sound business so for preventing theft the, some of the main things that are done right now um, are things like encryption which allows a service to be accessed anywhere uh, right now if you have a service that isn't encrypted and you access it from public wi-fi's uh, it's very easy for things to get lost um, or stolen i should say um, disclosure of key cloud providers so some some of these services they they all of their hardware, is, their cloud services are done through third parties. So um, if a customer doesn't know who that is, they might um, not be as confident if they, they're not as trusting as the key cloud provider. Um, Two-factor authentication, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with, which prevents unauthorized users from accessing. Um, data segregation, uh, which allows, or which prevents people that are trying to steal uh, data, if they get access to one part of the network, be it in any a various number of ways, uh, does that compromise the rest of the network where for other people that may have been more uh, secure with uh, who they let have access to their data? Um, and then for preventing loss, we have uh, data loss prevention, which is the services either themselves or having an agreement with third party companies to have protocols and standards in place and what happens in the event that uh, stuff is lost or how do we prevent loss from happening ever in the first place. Um, and that goes hand in hand with the recovery facilities and third party backups, um, which is also either done internally with the service that you're purchasing or the um, or third party companies to, to, if you want some level of abstraction for redundancy. So that's not all uh, resting on one person. And then finally, um, clear contracts, which is the customer being fully informed of how service operation is done. Um, a lot of a lot of these services, depending on the level, whether you're an individual or an enterprise customer, some of them it's just like, okay, give us the data and we'll take care of it. And that's not always a good thing. It's generally better for the customer to be informed on what exactly is being done with their data, um, especially when it's things like IP and property and stuff like that involved. Um, and we'll be, we'll be examining much more, but for now, the schedule is, uh, laid out as you can see, um, in terms of the, who is focusing on what, uh, Muhammad is going to be focused on the proposed solution and case studies. 
Tommy is going to be doing the introduction and the pros and cons of software as a service as a concept and why or why not uh, enterprises and individuals would want to um, engage with it. And then I'll be focusing on the current solutions, security challenges, and uh, case studies along with Mohammed. Um, and then for the in conclusion, I should say <clears throat> our goal is to perform a literature review and analysis of software as a service and the security challenges associated with it. Um, yeah, I believe that's all. And then on the last slide, we have our references. And um, if there are any questions? I got a question. Yes. Um, bit of a general one. What's something that you learned about SAAS in the past week that you didn't already know while you've been preparing for this presentation? Uh, the group can answer. Yeah, I would say for myself, I would say how how um, interdependent some of these software companies could be on third party companies because. For like, if so, if a company wants to provide a service and they're trying, they're a small startup type thing, and they want to be in on the devices of a million or hundreds of millions of users, they can't. Just, it's very hard for them to um, grow that infrastructure from the ground up just organically. It's generally very high upfront costs to get into that type of business. So, how much they rely on the third parties like the Googles, the Amazons, the stuff like that. To, um, it's interesting how it all goes up into like one or two providers of all the cloud software. Cool. Um, I have a question as well. Uh, to my understanding, it's more of like you pay for like a year in advance of something like this. And I was wondering when you were talking about pros and cons, do the pros outweigh the cons enough to spend this type of money and not just use like anything else? So generally, uh, I would say the pros outweigh the cons because the security has gotten a lot better over time. Um, so the pros, I mean, a lot of us already use, I don't know if you, if you personally use a service, a cloud service, but um, like even, even UCF uses a cloud service. I use cloud, a lot of us use cloud services and it's just um, a lot of us don't think about the security, mostly because security is so well um, and put that the con of the security is just, it's so outweighed by the pro. Um, that being said, there are some cons that we just don't realize, uh, mostly because we depend on the third party and we don't really see uh, what may be happening in the background. Um, but overall though, yes, so the pros do outweigh the cons, which is why a lot of organizations go end up doing um, an SAS overall. I have a follow-up question. Do you think that um, almost like not seeing those cons because people are so trusting in the pros is going to eventually come back to like almost bite everyone in the butt? Like, do you think different attacks are going to eventually evolve to be able to like take down those pros and make it almost have more cons? Um, it depends. So I remember when we did like the shark um, and he did kind of show us how to do it, but like that's like through Wi-Fi and like unsecured. Um, that depends on if something will come up like that for SAS on that on that side. Um, right now, I wouldn't think so because security is like it's really good. I mean, even with two-factor authentication, um, two-factor. If literally if you don't have that second device, you can't get into the to the other um, device, which is why they strongly suggest to have it. Um, so in the future, uh, I don't think it will because over time our security will get better and better. Um, just that people will get better at hacking and and um, more security will be developed. Gotcha. To follow up on that, one of the key advantages of it being a service is that because it's not a one-time purchase, there is the the financial infrastructure to say, hey, we want to use keep continue using the service for the next ten years for our business or because I like using it as an individual, um, there's an incentive to want to keep you as a customer. So they, they will, companies will often work to update their things so that it is as secure as possible or as secure as it needs to be um, for the purposes of their customers. All right, some good questions, guys. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, if there's no other questions, we'll move on to the next group. My group can go next. And what group number are you? 
We are group 14. Awesome, go ahead. Okay, so I'm Julia, and we're going to talk about um, securing cloud-based security as cyber attacks evolve. So as you guys know, um, cloud-based security is obviously a, an emerging trend in IT and network-based security, so it can protect against unauthorized access, DDoS attacks, hackers, malware attacks, um, just protects your data, data applications, um, infrastructure, all that from cyber attacks and threats using different technologies, um, strategies, policies, and services. Um, but there are obviously still some problems with cloud security. It is relatively new, um, so it does still have security issues, and um, which we're gonna get more into on the next slide, um, on, in two slides. But also cyber attacks are constantly changing and becoming more advanced and vicious. So cloud security needs to keep up um, with that evolution. They need to almost evolve together. Um, because cyber attacks nowadays are becoming um, like multi-vector and um, like polymorphic um, attacks almost, which means, you know, like an attack, it used to be you get a virus on your computer and it can like shut down your computer and affect that and just that. But now with cloud, it, you can attack and start on your phone. It can penetrate your cloud and then everything, your whole data center is shut down because of that. Um, and hackers are just constantly looking for new ways to like exploit individuals and businesses. So um, cloud security, keeping it secure and updated is very important in evolving with cyber attacks and understanding the newest like cyber trends almost is very important. So what we're gonna be looking um, at during our research is we're gonna focus on cloud-based security as an emerging trend in IT and network security. So we're gonna focus on the three areas um, an overview of just what cloud-based security is and um, the new types of cyber attacks that have led to this um, technology. So like a few of them is botnet, um, which is like a network of infected devices that are controlled by a hacker, just like gain access of smart devices. Um, another big one is um, crypto mining, um, you know, gaining control of someone's computer and mining for cryptocurrency. Um, DDoS attacks, so all of those we're going to be looking into um, the evolution of those. Um, we're going to look at security issues that still present themselves within cloud-based security options and what you can do to protect your network against the current vulnerabilities. And then we're also going to do an analysis of the modern cloud-based security um, and how it's changing and how it can keep being improved to protect against these network attacks. So I'm going to go ahead and pass off to Andy who's going to talk about cloud, the cloud-based security issues that we have. So for right now, uh, for uh, cloud-based security, we are facing this type of problem, the data branch uh, um, and accounts hijacking and also uh, denial of service attacks. And one of the uh, account hijacking example that uh, I have researched on, it was on uh, April uh, 2010 for Amazon face a uh, toss site scripting bug and then this target customer uh, credential and password and stuff like that. And also for the abuse of uh, cloud services also uh, happen uh, when uh, people is keep sharing the videos and music and books and those uh, have been, uh, they, they have, uh, copyrights and stuff like that. But uh, if people keep sharing those videos and music without uh, actually uh, getting the uh, assets to it, it will uh, get, end up getting uh, fines and stuff. And also, we also facing for cloud service uh, security, we also facing like data loss and stuff. Uh, and so, can you go to the next slide? And so the significance for doing uh, this research uh, since the cloud-based, uh, the hardware-based security infrastructure uh, has been transforming to the cloud-based security. And uh, be because the cloud-based security is uh, more flexible, 
for everyone that we can access to uh, different device and uh, probably anywhere that you can uh, find internet from. And also uh, cloud-based security uh, will be more secure uh, for, set, for sensitive, sensitive data like emails and storage. And uh, cyber attacks that involving and become more advanced and the cloud-based security has been, has the ability to uh, prevent from those attacks and keep the We'll be talking about more. I mean, that's your thing, or is it just me? Sorry hey, about that. I was, I was having internet problems for a second, but. Oh, okay. no, you're good. For our preliminary literature review, uh, we'll be talking about two main topics. The first topic we'll be discussing is the definition of cloud-based security and how it works. So pretty much what is cloud-based security? How do we use it and why do we use it? And, and then building off that, We'll see how it protects networks against cyber attacks, whether that's through multi-factor authentication or only allowing certain data to certain users, and, and then types of advanced cyber attacks, whether it's whether it's through malware or even through an insider threat. Then the, the next section we'll be discussing is modern cloud-based security architecture and future innovations. So we'll be looking at current cloud-based security architecture and viability against threats, whether it's from whether it's from a company that, is, that specializes in security, such as Kaspersky. Or, or a company that's used by everyone like Apple with iCloud. And then we'll take a look at innovations and concepts that are being introduced. Next slide. All right, so for our focus areas, Julia will be looking at what cloud-based security is and why it's necessary. Andy will be looking at cloud-based security threats and challenges. And I'll be looking at modern cloud-based security architecture and future innovations. For our, as far as our schedule goes, this, this past week, we worked on our research. This, this coming week, we'll, we'll start working on our report and then following up off of that, we'll have a PowerPoint and presentation. And, and then we'll have our final touches and finally our presentation and submission. And so to, con to conclude, our aspirations are to complete a thorough literature review on security and cloud-based security as cyber attacks evolve that identifies through an understanding of cloud-based security, the cyber attack and security threats that we face and the steps that must be taken to counteract them now and in the future. So other than that, we just have references. So um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, could you explain a little bit more about the, I guess, threats about insider attacks specifically? Yeah, for sure. So um, one of the biggest parts of cloud-based security is making sure that only certain users have access to certain data be, because if their account becomes compromised, it makes sure that they don't have access to everything. Now, if there's an insider threat when say you're 
supply and security for a company. If someone within that company decides that that they want to work with someone on the outside to breach that company's data, um, then that could be a huge problem, obviously. So it's about managing those insider threats to make sure that events like that do not occur. So kind of like another follow-up thing with that. Um, so a big thing that I was kind of looking at was cloud content management systems. Those are becoming a lot more popular, um, but they also have a lot of threats with them. Um, they have a lot of inside issues because um, they are not known as being the most secure. Um, so it, it's something as small as like one password from somebody can get out and then the entire cloud can be taken down. Um, the cloud content, content management system can be taken down by somebody from the outside. So um, like as great as it is to have everything in the cloud, easy to access, something small like that, um, just like one little security detail can take out the whole thing. So um, definitely focusing on upping the security of that type of stuff. So like that one, including you know, like multi um, authentic authentication, um, stuff like that. Yeah, I see, I see exactly what you mean. Um, I also think that you could also study like ransomware attacks too. Because if somebody in a company does have access to the cloud and everything like that, and they fall for a ransomware attack, then not only is their service done, but also all the data of the company and everything like right. that. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I think that would be good to study too. Does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Well, just, oh, sorry. Or go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to know, um, based on what you've already learned, do you think that the evolution of attacks versus security, do you think that security is farther along or do you think attacks are farther along? 100% attacks are further along, which is super unfortunate for everyone, but it definitely is. That's just how it is. Um, I feel like there's a lot more incentive to attack than there is almost to protect, which is sad. Um, and there's actually a very um, like low number of people right now, for some reason, who are willing to go into um, cybersecurity positions. It's at an all-time low. Um, and overall, with companies who require cybersecurity positions, um, it was like 65% of companies have um, like empty spots. So there's just a lack of security, nobody really wanting to do it. They don't see that much incentive of protecting, whereas hackers on the other side, they're like, well, I mean, hey, if I get in, I get what I want. And if I don't, I can basically, I'm smart enough to protect myself or nobody will find that it was me. Well, thank you. My question was, um, what, what is a, a content management network or system? Um, a content management system is something that can be used to um, like create a website or something like that. So for example, um, there's like headless and monolithic content management systems. Um, so an example of like a uh, monolithic one, which includes everything, um, which means no custom coding for like web development would be something called Drupal. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, um, but it's basically just used to design and create um, web platforms. So Drupal is the one I brought up um, actually because it's used by NASA and the White House. So it's a pretty big one. Um, it, um, like I said, used to create their website. So it stores all of their data. It can, it's like you go on the NASA homepage and you see all that stuff that's created by a content management system. Um, but there's also like an inside part to that where um, NASA, I'm assuming, has some kind of um, website that's for employees only. You go in, you see your employee portal, it's where you log your time card, stuff like that. Um, so if a hacker is able to get into that, you know, not only can they be messing with like the news feed on the page that like anybody can see on like a regular, regular website, but they also may be able to gain access to an employee's personal information, um, addresses, phone numbers, their bank statements, stuff like that. All right. Cool. Thank you. Um, I have one question. So, uh, for for the for the hackers, do you think that um, most of these hackings are happening because like people are getting scammed? Um, like they get tricked into like signing into something. They give them their password and username because they turn to a certain website. Um, do you think that's like mostly, or do you think people are actually like actually figuring out um, like a way around the whole system? 
Do either of you guys want to answer? Sorry, I feel like I'm talking. Yeah, you're good. Well, um, hacking and cyber attacks, they're very versatile. They can, they, they can happen in so many ways. So, I mean, like, of course, there are going to be talented hackers that will be able to find a way around everything. But for the, but for the most part, it's happening because people are being reckless with their information and making themselves vulnerable to hackers. Yeah, I would say that um, most hackers are able to get in because they found a way in, not by tricking people. Most computer systems are smart enough now to um, see stuff like that, the trying to trick people like, oh, click on this link because you just want a new iPhone, stuff like that. Um, computers are becoming smart enough to recognize what that is and block it. So definitely most hackings now are due to um, people actually being able to find a flaw in the system and get in themselves, not by tricking and like, causing someone to accidentally let them in kind of thing. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Well, thanks for listening to us. All right, awesome. Um, so if there is no more questions for that group, then uh, would anybody else like to volunteer next? Um, sure, we could do it. Um, let's see. We're going to be, it's just called um, Group 10. Yeah, Group 10. Should new businesses build physical servers or use the cloud? Um, so I'm going to start this off. Um, basically, this is going to be pointed towards any kind of business. It could be small business, medium size, or, or a very large business. Um, can you go to the next slide, John? Um, so yeah, so if you're going to build a business infrastructure, you can choose between having physical servers on premises, or you can use a cloud um, with services like AWS Lambda, Microsoft Azure, or um, Google Cloud Platform. And basically, they're going to have their pros and cons. Um, so we're gonna dig deeper into these pros and cons. Um, just for example, like maybe a, a restaurant who wants to store some data um, just on their customer's most recent transactions, they could go with either of these approaches. Um, so if they wanna like rely on the internet, then one would be better for the other. Um, there's many factors that could sway them towards one way or the other. Um, for example, like cost, if it's a, a smaller business, it would probably be easier for them to go with the cloud just because they won't need to build the infrastructure right then. They could go get it instantaneously. Um, there's a lot of other factors that come into play here. Um, if you're going to store it, there's going to be security issues too in the cloud. Um, security is going to be probably a, a little bit more secure in my opinion, because there's more people looking after it. Um, you're actually paying them to do that as well. And if you have a, a physical server on premises, you could have an attacker that works there that could get in there. Um, so the security is a big issue. Um, can you go to the next slide, John? All right, so basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna target businesses or students who are just curious about this topic. And since the cloud platform is so new and it's gaining so much popularity, um, I see that more people are gonna probably point in that direction. And uh, what we're gonna research is the financial significance that it has. Um, because the cloud platform, it will be a little more expensive at the beginning 
because you're paying for infrastructure instantaneously, but you also can scale much easier. So scalability is gonna also be something that we're looking into um, in the literature review. Um, Perfect. Can you go to the next slide, John? All right. John, you want to take it from there? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, so the most important choice of a startup business is um, whether to build a server or go serverless. Um, both of these have their clear advantages and disadvantages, um, and it's up to the business to decide which route it should go. Um, some of the factors include scalability. Um, how big does a server need to be to continue delivering a product to its clients? Um, cost efficiency. Startups don't have much money as settled companies. Therefore, they need to balance uh, cost and scale. Deployment time. How long would it take to create an application? Um, based off of serverless versus programming using on-site servers, user experience, um, is the software intuitive, easy to access, um, and much more, resource allocation, does the application run more efficiently, um, can it be optimized easier or better using either approach, um, next slide please, um, so with a lot of things, there are problems and limitations. Um, one of the first problems are latency. So since the applications are not running on site, they are subject to latency issues. And depending on how time sensitive your applications or code needs to be, um, it might become a major issue whether or not to uh, whether or not a startup decides if it should pursue a service architecture. Um, usually server providers will stop code from running when it's not in use, so it doesn't sit idle. Um, this adds to the latency issue since code would need to be constantly restart from a cold state, um, as well as timeouts. So your code is packaged um, into these things called containers which are usually like blocks of code and all the dependencies and whatnot um, needed to run the, the program within the container. And um, these containers usually have a window where they have a brief time to run. And if your code isn't finished in time, then the program could fail. Therefore, it can, if, uh, it can impact performance um, of your program or whatever you're trying to deliver to the customer, um, as well as security attacks, so since serverless computing is a uh, service provided, um, it usually operates with many different clients and DDoS attacks are very common. Security risks where usually where you have these big companies that uh, provide you with these services of, um, of providing your company a server, um, then DDoS attacks will usually come and overload the server, which will prevent your company from continuing on um, for that short time where they try to resolve that attack. Um, debugging on a remote server is troublesome. So due to, due to serverless functions being remote, they bring a lot more points of failure due to, due to having more components, such as like more routers along the way, and not like locally available. Um, so debugging servers functions are, are possible. However, they're not as efficient as having it locally available since you're required to use specific tools that these companies give you, which can be more difficult and time consuming than being there in person, um, as well as performance optimization, optimizations are limited to code. So given that the client uh, can't access to the physical hardware, um, the only optimizations to the application that can be made is from the software side. Uh, given this, usually service providers will offer separate paid services that can enhance performances. Um, this can not only limit true performance gains provided through 
hardware optimizations, uh, but they can also bring out another cost element since you have to pay for these services. And you can move on to the next slide. Hey, hey. Uh, my name is Andrew. Uh, if I cut off, my internet's been spotty, so just let me know. But uh, the way we intend to organize our information for our literature review is that first we're going to uh, split it into three main sections. The first section would be the benefits of having cloud-based servers. So this would be the serverless approach. Um, servers would be located offsite. And um, what we're mainly going to be looking at is cost analysis of using a subscription uh, versus having to make your own servers and then maintain them. So on one hand, uh, we would have to analyze whether it would be better to constantly have a, um, I guess, easy to track subscription cost versus how much it might cost per year to maintain versus like or including like hiring an IT person to manage them. Um, data integrity, so referring back to how when you're debugging a system, um, it might have to go through multiple different connections and you know bits and pieces could be lost along the way and how it would affect, I guess, the company when server sizes happen or server change server size changes happen. And um, uh, more costs have to be factored in there to like increase the amount of space allocated for where the servers would sit inside the office or the company space. Uh, the next session would be um, the benefits of a physical design. So this would be having servers on site. Um, and some of the obvious benefits would be that they're more secure in a physical sense, as in uh, there are less connections going in and out of the company that directly interact with the data that's sensitive. Uh, so offline storage would obviously like you wouldn't have to transfer any of the information outside of the company. It would always stay inside of the building. Uh, of course, this leaves it more vulnerable to more physical attacks, such as people who are hired, um, as discussed in previous uh, proposals. And relatively low cost for beginning, um, as in you don't have to actually buy any servers. You don't have to actually pay for the electricity to run those kind of servers that will transfer information in and out of the other computers in the system. Um, and then after we analyze all these uh, pros and cons of these two different approaches together, uh, in the end, we would do a general analysis. So this would include a financial analysis and whether or not companies should stick with the system as they grow. So uh, we would begin with their fledging tech based, um, like when they just begin, and then what it might be, should their startup succeed and then evolve into a larger tech company. And then our um, supposed schedule that we made, uh, pretty similar to everyone else's as well. Uh, we're in, going to be going into the first week where we research and we outline and we plan what we plan to put in each section of our literature review. Uh, we're going to begin drafting the final review so that we can begin uh, putting the information on the slides in the next week so that we can practice rehearsing it for the fourth week. And then obviously on the last week, uh, we just finalize everything and we make sure that we know what we're about to say for the presentation. And so for our focus topics, uh, I'll mainly be focusing on the financial analysis aspect of our literature review. So I'd be doing the numbers and stuff, uh, quantifying what would be, because it's a relatively subjective uh, analysis of whether which, which one would be better. Uh, so finding a way to quantify that and make it like scientific. Um, Corey, Mr. Corey would be focusing on the scalability. So this should be starting from a lower point and then making it so we our analysis fits for should companies grow into the future? And Mr. John will be focusing on performance and security, which deals with the uh, cloud aspect and how uh, physical servers may perform differently versus how cloud services could be attacked. And then uh, we can to the conclusion. So in summary, um, basically, we're going to have a way to condense all the information that we're going to collect over our research period um, so that businesses who are interested in this kind of thing who have to make this decision uh, because a large amount of capital is invested in this in the beginning of a business, whether they should go one way or the other, maybe a hybrid mix of both. Um, and yeah, so I don't know if anyone else in the group wants to chime in on this. Um, one other thing that I would like to add is um, if a company is starting out and they're not sure how fast they're going to grow, then using a cloud platform would be it would be a good choice for them, I think, because they could scale up really quick. But if it's a business where they know how many customers they're going to have and they don't expect growth very quick, um, then a physical server would probably be better. Um, and also, 
it uh if you have a physical server you don't need to rely on the internet so if your internet goes down then your data is still safe um anyone else want to add anything to that um no i think i'm good anyone have questions last slide we have references uh, which we truncated and summarized in the previous slides so yeah questions can you just elaborate again on why a physical server is better for like a smaller business who knows the numbers that they're going to have? Um, I would say because if you go to a cloud platform, they're going to charge you more like per bit of data that you store compared to a physical server because you're physically paying for the hardware. So you don't, you're like cutting out the middleman there. Um, that's why it would be cheaper to do it a uh, physical server. And for gotcha. smaller businesses, for uh, it would be less required to hire IT people to manage it because um, until it gets to like the really large numbers amount of servers, then it would be pretty easy to just make sure that the information just goes in and out seamlessly. Okay, thanks. Um, what, what do you say you have to hire an IT for either option? to manage um, whether it's physical or um, virtual. Right. So, um, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sure, I was just gonna say, um, so cloud services, usually their IT people are indirect. So the company that would be uh, purchasing the cloud service would not have to hire their own IT people. So that would be managed by the uh, company providing the cloud service, which is why their premium for their data transfer would be higher than if you just had a physical server, because a physical server um, until you need that kind of assistance, like if you, let's say you're like a small company of like maybe like five people, um, if they're all tech savvy, then they would be able to IT themselves without having to hire an additional person. Correct. And just to just to add on to that, um, usually if small companies um, prefer the serverless route, then they can mainly focus on their application and um, deliver that um, instead of trying to hire an IT person and manage their their stacks of uh, code and, and whatnot. Um, so they can just completely um, focus on um, creating that application for the client. Okay, cool. Thank Are you. you guys going to like study the differences between platform as a service and infrastructure? Um, because to my understanding, you guys are just uh, studying like only whether a smaller business should go for infrastructure as a service. Mm. Yeah, I think we're going to stick with uh, infrastructure as a service. Okay. Any more questions? Mm. 